Okay, so let's get started. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Sanjeev Kumar, and uh, welcome to the last oral session of the day. Uh, we'll have four talks in this session, and first talk will be uh, A-star sampling. Uh, it is a work from Chris Madison, Daniel Tarlow, and Tom Minka. And uh, as you all know, this is a uh, winner of one of the NIPS awards this year. Uh, please welcome the authors. And Chris Madison will be giving the talk. Hi, and thanks for coming. This is joint work with Danny Tarlow and Tom Minka. And at a very high level, what we hope to show you in this work is that you can take a distribution of interest, define a random objective function, optimize it with A star search, and return a sample from that distribution. Hence, A star sampling. So a little more specifically. The goal is, given an unnormalized log density phi of x, produce independent samples from the Gibbs distribution p of x, which is proportional to x of phi of x. The real star of this work is the Gumbel distribution. And because it's maybe not the first distribution you learn about, I'm going to step back uh, and explain it. And it's crucial to the, sort of the entirety of the, of the work. G a random variable is said to be Gumbel distributed with location m if its density is the following uh, expression. And this is what it looks like. Uh, this is also known as the double exponential. And the Gumbel distribution has a lot of really cool properties. And I hope to convince you of that. But I'm going to outline two of them that, that sort of form the foundation of this work. The first is that the Gumbel distribution is known as max stable. So that if we take a sample of independent Gumbels, and look at the distribution of their max, that object is also gumbly distributed, but with a different location. So for example, if we sample G1 and G2 from a gumbel zero, then the max of those two is distributed as a gumbel log two. The second property was the inspiration of this work, so I'll slow down a little bit to, to really cover it. So suppose we're interested uh, in sampling from a finite distribution over, let's say, the integers 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So now we're interested in p of i, where that's proportional to x of phi of i. And the figure at the bottom shows this distribution in pictures, where the height of the little gray bars is the unnormalized log probability of each of the integers. If we draw an independent gumbel 0 for each of the integers, and add it to the unnormalized log probability, thereby perturbing the function, and scan across from 1 to 5 looking for the maximum of this little system, we find that if we return the, the, max, the location of the max, which in this case is 4, that's an exact sample from p of i. So more formally, if we look at any subset of the indices b, it turns out that the argmax of this process is distributed by the Gibbs distribution restricted to that subset B. And the value at the max, the maximum, is distributed as a gumbel log sum exp of phi for the indices in B. OK, so that's a cute little trick. And we asked ourselves, well, is there something more? Is there something deeper going on here? Or is just this some quirk of the gumbel distribution for discrete spaces? And in particular, what about continuous space? So to unpack that question a little bit, we're going to answer two questions. The first is, there an analogous process for perturbing infinite spaces? And can we then define practical algorithms for optimizing it? OK, so now we're going to move away from discrete space. So we're interested again in p of x, which is proportional to x of phi of x. And this is a distribution defined over the reals. And we're going to define a measure function that takes in a subset b of the reals and computes the integral or the volume under the unnormalized density. This works in any dimension, but for this talk, we'll just look at r, the reals. OK, so I'm going to reframe a little bit the, the first example so that it, it's clear the sense in which we want to move to continuous space. 
In the first example, we produced a sequence of Gumbel values, the GIs plus phi i's, and their locations. And we produced it such that the maximum of the Gumbel values for all of the indices that fall in B have this distribution, the Gumbel log partition function, and that the arg max is distributed as the Gibbs distribution restricted to B. So by analogy, we want to construct some sort of sequence of Gumbel values and of their locations, this time in R. And this is going to be an infinite sequence. But we want it to be the case that if we look at the maximum value of G's for all of the X's that they correspond, for the X that corresponds to, the, sorry, the maximum value over B um, for all the X's that fall in that subset B, that that has a, has a marginal distribution, which is a Gumbel log measure of B, and that the arg max is distributed as the Gibbs distribution restricted to B. The problem with moving directly from the discrete case into the infinite case is that generating infinitely many random variables and then finding the maxes is a complete non-starter. And this is the sort of bottom-up approach that we took in the first case. And it would be really nice if, on the other hand, we could go top-down. In other words, if we could pick the max and its location and then generate the remainder of the process. So in other words, we could generate maxes over increasingly refined subsets of space so that we know where and what value the max takes on in that subset. And it's another really cool and sort of remarkable property of the Gumbel distribution that if you do this sort of top-down procedure with Gumbel noise in the discrete case, both of the directions are equivalent. And that gives us the leverage to move into infinite spaces. And so I'm going to describe now this sort of top-down construction. I'm going to give an example run-through for, for the reals. And so just to remember, we're going to produce this infinite sequence of GKs and XKs. The Gs are going to represent the bounds, or the, sorry, the maximal values on the noise for their corresponding subsets, and the XKs are going to be their locations. So we begin by sampling X1 from the Gibbs distribution over the whole space. We sample its Gumbel value, which is the maximum over the whole space, and we sample it from a Gumbel log volume of R. We split the space on X1, and now we're going to go into B and then B complement, and for B we're going to generate its maximum Gumbel and its location. So we generate the location based from the Gibbs distribution restricted to B, and we generate its maximal Gumbel value with location log volume of B. But because we already generated the max for the whole space, it has to be the case that this value is less than G1. So we truncate it at G1. So this is just a truncated Gumbel distribution. And it turns out that this is the right thing to do to produce the process that we are interested in. We do the same for B complement. And then we recursively subdivide space generating regional maxes and their locations. The punchline of this section is that if you do this process and you generate this infinite stream, and you look at, whenever, at, at the maximal Gumbel value when you hit a set B, its marginal distribution is a log measure of B, with, is a Gumbel distribution with location log measure of B, and the arg max has this restricted distribution. And so we're going to call this collection, this set of these random variables, which are the maxes of the values that hit B, for all the subsets of R, we're going to call that collection a Gumbel process. OK, so let's step back and recap. I, I told you at the beginning that we wanted to draw independent samples. We found a process whose optima are samples. But the procedure for generating it assumes we can draw independent samples. So obviously we need to move beyond that, and that's the topic of the second section of the talk, which is a way to practically optimize a Gumbel process without assuming that you can tractably sample from our distribution of interest P of X and compute the volumes mu of B. And this algorithm is called A-star sampling. Okay, so the first idea is like in rejection sampling to decompose the log density phi into a tractable and a boundable component. 
In this case, i of x is the tractable component and o of x is the boundable component. And what we require is that for, for a subset B, for any subset B that we can tractably sample and compute volumes from a distribution Q of X, which you can think of as a proposal distribution, like in rejection sampling, which is proportional to X of I, the tractable component, and that we can bound O within that region. And the reason this decomposition is useful is that we can also decompose Gumbel processes. So what do I mean by that? In particular, we can take a stream of values, G superscript Q, from the Gumbel process for Q, which was our proposal distribution, and transform it into a realization of a Gumbel process for P, simply by adding the difference in the log densities to the Gumbel values. Once we've done that, so we've taken the stream and added the O of X's, then the objects that we were looking at previously now have the right property. So if we take the max of the Gumbel value and O of X at its location for all of the X's that hit B, and remember that this is from the Q distribution, the G's and the X's, um, that there, the distribution of that is now a Gumbel log measure mu of B, which corresponded to P, and that the arg max is distributed according to the P distribution restricted to B. Okay, so pictorially, suppose this were uh, a re the top five gumbles from a realization of, of a gumble process for Q. We can add O of X to each value. So notice that the magnitude, the, the height of the black bars doesn't change, just their relative position on the screen. And then transform it into a gumble process for P. Sorry, this is transformed into a gumble process for P. We just redraw the line and notice that the absolute heights doesn't change, just the relative heights. So this is now a realization of a Gumbel process for P. Okay, so we know then that if we want to draw a sample, we have to find the argmax of this process of G plus O of X from the Q process. And what's great about this is that we can bound both the contribution from the noise of the Q-Gumbel process, which comes from the G's, which are bounds on the noise in that region of space, and the contribution of O of X. This is something that, the, that our community is very good at bounding. This is the sort of space of rejection sampling sort of things. Um, and so in particular, because we're interested in optimizing a sum of things, we know that that's upper bounded by the sum of the, of the individual optima. Okay, so the core idea then is to use A star search to find this optima. And the reason it's A star search is that we're gonna explore regions and expand them in order of non-increasing upper bounds. And once, and we're gonna keep track of a lower bound, and then we know that as soon as the lower bound has crossed our upper bound, even if we were to continue running the process, we couldn't find anything better, and that the location of that lower bound, the best one so far, is in fact a sample from our distribution of interest, P of X. Okay, so these are the ingredients that we need. We have the stream of values from Q. And reminder again, the, Q, the G bounds the noise in its subset. We have upper bounds on a subset in Q, on the subset B. This is the Gumbel value and the bound on O. And we also have lower bounds which is to say the Gumbel value and, the, and O at its location X. Generally speaking, the two most expensive operations are computing the bounds and the difference of the log density. Okay, so another run through. So here we are on O of X. We sample the first Gumbel value and its location. And remember that this Gumbel value is a bound on the noise for the whole space. So we can add to the Gumbel value the bound on O to receive an upper bound on the entire process. We can also at this point compute the lower bound on the process, which is that G value itself, because we can only do better than that. We then split space and compute upper bounds in the left and the right subregion. And to do that, we need to sample Gumbels and locations over there, but we don't need to evaluate O of X on those. And now we see that our lower bound has not passed above the highest upper bound left on the queue. And so we pick the next highest upper bound on the queue. 
evaluate uh, O of X2, sorry, we moved into the right subregion, that was why it was the, that's, that's the next highest, and we evaluate O of X2, update our lower bound, and now split space again around X2, and recompute upper bounds on its two children subregions. And now we see that the lower bound that we found so far is higher than the next highest upper bound on the Q. And so we're guaranteed that this process can't increase the G's anymore. And that means that X2 is an exact sample from our distribution of interest. Okay, so at this point, I would probably tell you a lot about experiments that we've done, um, but there isn't a whole lot of time. We've done a lot of interesting experiments relating A star sampling to other samplers, and we invite you to come visit us at, at the poster. We've also done an analysis relating A star sampling to re adaptive rejection type samplers. A little bit of a teaser there. Um, there's A star sampling has this interesting property that it, that it, it can prune regions of space. This means that it couples which regions it ends up refining and where the sample ends up being. And so this leads to more efficient use of bounds and likelihoods relative to these adaptive rejection type samplers. Um, when might you use this algorithm? Whenever you sit down to implement slice sampling or rejection sampling for low dimensional but non-trivial distributions, you should consider A star. So for example, uh, if you, you have complicated conditionals in your Gibbs sampler. Um, and this is because it in many cases is more efficient than the alternatives. I want to be really clear, this algorithm doesn't solve the problem of high dimensions. It scales poorly in the worst case. And this isn't that surprising though because it's a general purpose sampler and it's exact. It's guaranteed to return an exact sampler when it, sample when it converges. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, we've shown how to extend the Gumbel Max trick to continuous spaces. We've defined A star sampling, which is a practical algorithm that optimizes a Gumbel process with A star. And the result is a new generic sampling algorithm and uh, a useful perspective on the sampling problem. Thank you. Questions, please? Please go to the microphone if you can. Okay, so let me ask one. Okay. Uh, uh, so you're effectively using some sort of branch and bound procedure here. How does the dimensionality affect the sampling? Yeah, so when we first started working on this, we were really hoping that it wouldn't kill us, but um, what ends up happening basically is that the, the partitioning of space hurts you. So it's not so bad in one dimension to cut things up into intervals, but as soon as you go to high dimensions, you're, you're cutting up hypercubes. Um, it gets quite bad, and that's, that's one of the problems with this, and the other problem is that in high dimensions, bounds can become very uninformative. Uh, and the, 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 one of the most important things in this is how informative your bounds are. Uh, this is very cool stuff. I'm just wondering um, how how strong is the assumption that you can, they can split your distribution to an efficiently sampleable part and a, efficient, and a boundable part? Um, so it's, it's more or less the same assumption that we make for rejection sampling, so about as reasonable as rejection sampling. All right, let's thank the speaker once again. Uh,